there. Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank Lars and Sarah and everyone from KITP for inviting me here. Um, it's really amazing to, uh, to be here embedded with all you great scientists, and I'm really you know, honored and a little bit intimidated. But that's normal for me because I work at a, at a computing center, the Texas Advanced Computing Center. It's part of the University of Texas, and there's some pretty smart people there, too. And uh, I'm just always out of my depth, and I'm used to it by now. So my talk is called Cyborg Journalism, Reporting from the Front Lines of Scientific Computing. And we'll get to why it's called that in a bit. So I'm going to start off by just talking about myself, you know, who I am and how I got here, how I got to be standing in front of you guys. Um, you know, science journalists, maybe even more so than scientists, come in all different forms and uh, take part in all different parts of the knowledge ecosystem. Unlike a lot of the science journalists that maybe you've dealt with before, I am not a PhD. I'm not someone who went through you know, a science program, was in the labs, and then realized that that wasn't really for them. I'm more of just a normal journalist who increasingly found science really interesting and found that there were really good stories there that were the kind of stories that I wanted to tell. Um, not, just, not just articles, but my background was actually in documentary filmmaking. That was sort of how I got to where I am. And um, scientists are pretty cool, interesting people. So I always found them to be great subjects for documentaries. And as, I, so as I'm saying here, it's, it's not really all about the science for me. You know, it's often about the people, the processes, and really the creativity that underlies the pursuit and progress of science. I think people were definitely interested in the newest technology and any kind of life-saving health measures that might be coming out. But there's another subset of popular uh, for people out there who really just want to know what you guys are doing. And so I've sort of taken that angle. Um, so in that sense, I'm really like my readers. I'm, I'm hungry for stories. So um, before my current job, this interest kind of took me all over the place. So and as a filmmaker, I went to West Texas. I was documenting efforts to protect prairie dogs. I went to high schools to study uh, inner city approaches to science learning. Went to Lake Okeechobee to find out about the Everglades and to forests where they were developing these brain-eating flies to incapacitate fire ants. So I, I thought this was all pretty cool stuff. Um, at the same time, I was working on feature-length films that had nothing to do with science. And these sort of had more of a social justice-oriented tilt to them. Um, teenage boys in America, family being sort of in their last months of a homeless um, center, and um, people after Katrina who were beginning again to dance. These are elderly people who had a long dancing tradition. These were things that showed on PBS and film festivals. I enjoyed them. They weren't science related, but that didn't, you know, that wasn't where I ended up. So in 2007, I was looking around to see what I could do, and I found this post for a job as a science writer at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. I knew nothing about supercomputers. You know, I had just the vaguest sense of what that even meant. But digging into what they were doing, the kind of science they supported, I realized this was something that I could that I could dig, you know, that I could learn a lot from, have constantly changing subject matter, and you know, work at a, a place kind of at the cutting edge of science. And so I jumped on that opportunity. What I quite didn't realize at that time was that the center where I worked for had just won this big grant, big quote unquote. You guys work on big science too, I'm sure. Uh, this was a 50 million dollar supercomputer, one of the one of the largest in the world. And uh, our center didn't really have anybody who was doing communications. And from the National Science Foundation's perspective, perspective that, wasn't gonna, that wasn't good enough. You know, if they're going to invest this money, they want the public to know what it's for. And so I was hired a bit sort of as like an adjunct to this machine. Um, <laughs> which, as I said, they didn't tell me that right off the bat. But once I got in there, it became clear you know, that Ranger and supercomputers in general needed a publicist. <laughs> and that I was going to be that guy. So I embraced it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, s oh, say it again. Your position is short-lived. <laughs> no, no, I've moved on. Ranger is now gone, and the new, the new system is in place, and I'm still writing about that. And, you know, it, it's, it's broader. This is the simplified version. Uh, but it, it, there's a real need for it. I mean, I think the, the general public does not have an understanding of the role that supercomputing plays, or computers in general, or uh, instrumentation in the science that you guys do. And they, the NSF, and I agree, thought that it was worthwhile to have somebody telling that story. But not in a way that uh, subsumed your research into the supercomputer. 
it's just a piece of machinery. It's just a bunch of interconnects and chips. It doesn't do anything unless you guys program it to do something interesting. So there was this balance that I always had to reach between machine, science, and people. So for the last six years, I've worked as what I consider sort of an embedded reporter uh, at TAC. I'm, I'm pretty much the only guy there who's doing anything like this, and the only one with sort of a humanities, generalist background. Um, and what I've been doing is working to represent the uses and significance of high-performance computing in the 21st century. And I've probably written as many articles on this subject over the last six years as anybody. 50 a year or so about all different topics, because it's, it's a very much a general instrument. There's almost no field of science or humanities or social sciences at this point that doesn't use supercomputing for something. And I've been trying to get at that breadth of, of usage. So, so I, you know, my position was called a science writer, which I always liked. Other names for this are public relations coordinator, public information officer, press officer, PR flack, if you're not really a fan of this position. I see myself a bit as a science grunt, you know, sort of someone that's at the front lines, an infantry, infantry man, and a translator of the really interesting thing you, things you guys do, bring it to the people who may be interested in it who you don't even know about and who don't know about you. Oops. Because it were important if we're ever going to get any more money. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, and we'll get to some of that too. Uh, just the outline here, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to talk a little bit about this cyborg aspect of the journalism, uh, quote unquote. And then we're going to talk a little about just some media tips and how you guys can be engaged or not as you see fit. So anyway, there's some stigma associated with this public information officer. I'm not sure if you guys know this or not. But um, you know, it's some people, some reporters, editors at Nature Magazine might say, hey, this is not real reporting. This is hype. It's uninformed. You know, it's, it's not doing it's due diligence. Well, I disagree with all those things. But it's occasionally true and fair, because we're, we are there to promote the science and the work of our center in order to, to keep money flowing. However, the reality is that. Uh, very few newspapers, very few TV news stations have a science journalism department anymore. They might have one person who does health and science, if that, and if not, they have nothing. And so increasingly, the mainstream media is relying on public information officers to tell the stories. And our, I think that the respect that we're being afforded just as a, as a consequence of this economic situation is growing. So I feel no shame. <laughs> So just to give you a sense of the kind of science that I write about, these are the four stories that I have in progress right now. This first one just came out. I'll talk you through them real quick. It's called Shields to Maxima, Mr. Scott, obviously a reference to Star Trek. And uh, this is about simulating the impact of space junk, orbital debris on spacecrafts. So this is something that can't be done on Earth, that the speeds and the sizes that are required to simulate the re what would happen if you know, the International Space Station hits a, you know, a, a rock this big. So it can only be done on a supercomputer. And that's a story that had just came out last week. And I'm going to, in a few slides, I'll show you how that's sort of spinning out into the world. Then this next one is um, some work by folks at Princeton and Iowa State. Mike Lef so, Eric, can I ask? So yeah. Are, uh, who, who decides? You have the editor. No. Yeah. I am the editor. I think in, in most situations, in most universities um, or at your institute, you will probably go, be going to, hopefully, you'll go, take the initiative to go to your press officer and bring the story. Because of this sort of um, middle ground that supercomputing centers play, nobody's telling us what they're doing. So it's really up to me to sleuth out the stories, read the, the, read the journals, find out what interesting supercomputing work is done, talk to people who are leaders in the field, and find these. Uh, these, uh, I'll show you in a second, these are all stories that are initially going to go on our homepage of our supercomputing center, National Science Foundation, NASA, and then they sort of get spun out into the world through various news wires. And I'll show you a case study in just a second. So uh, the third one is some metagenomics research by the J. Craig Ventner Institute. They take samples from oceans all over the world. They do huge uh, genetic sampling of it, computers to do the statistical analytics, and then they're able to make some deductions about um, what is out there that we've never experienced before. Because 75% of the organisms in the world, we have no clue exist, probably more. And then this last one is the linguists, you know, uh, from the linguistics department, working with computer scientists to improve natural language processing. 
It's a DARPA-funded research project. So as you can tell, pretty diverse stuff. The, the, the linking factor is the things that supercomputers do, which are themselves somewhat diverse, but a narrower subset. So amazingly, people read these stories, um, which you know I find them interesting, but I, they have a larger audience than I would expect. Science is really cool right now. Then they discuss them you know, through online forums like Slashdot. This story here, I think, had 143 comments, people just debating various aspects or making jokes, one or the other. They tweet about them. That strikes me as pretty strange, too. Uh, but hundreds of tweets for each of these stories. The world is hungry. So here's a case study that actually just happened this weekend. So I thought this would be a useful one. This is that uh, space research, the, the, the space junk story. Had a couple publications. This one's upside down. This was uh, American Aeronautic Institute paper from November 2012. And then there was a presentation uh, that was at one of their conferences. More recently, they have titles like Simulation of Orbital Debris Impact on Porous Ceramic Tiles. So it doesn't quite galvanize the public. But it wasn't that hard also to figure out that this is something that people could be interested in. You know, Things hitting space shuttles, or, that's cool. So sort of the flow of information was I, I found out about this. This is a guy actually has been using our supercomputers for seven, eight years on all kinds of different research, incrementally adding these papers and developing a whole new framework for fabric impacts in general. So I, I thought this was interesting. I turned it into an article for our website called Jill Simax and Mr. Scott. Passed it through the Eureka Alert uh, AAAS Newswire, and overnight, more or less, it gets picked up. So this is the NSF Newswire. They were very interested in the story. They sent that out to their millions of readers in the morning. Science Daily. That's a slash dot. Does anybody here know who's, what slash dot is? Okay. It's news for geeks. It's an aggregator. It's an aggregator where, where the community gives thumbs up, thumbs down on news stories, and then they get sent out to several million people each day, the top science technology stories. And it's a real bump for anything we do. So I was very happy this morning to find out that this story was deemed you know, interesting enough to the mainstream public that it was shipped off to everybody to read in their morning emails. So that's cool because that really spins up the number of people who get to read these stories. And you need to be part of an organization that's you know, that's under their umbrella, so University of Texas is, and it has to be somewhat timely. So the last few months, a paper, a presentation, something needed to come out, you know, that made it a new story as opposed to just something that happened. Um, so from your perspective, okay, maybe this is interesting, maybe it isn't, but the one point I want to make is, in terms of the researcher's time, it probably took less than an hour and a half to spin up their article, you know, which had a readership in their community, but was probably pretty small. And then to talk to me, maybe do one or two edits of the final piece, and then to sort of send it out into the world. And the editing's important. I don't send out anything that the researchers haven't read before. Journalists don't really approve of that, but I'm not trying to do a, get, uh, like a gotcha on anybody. I want to make sure that you guys are comfortable with the story that I'm telling about your research, because there's only so much I'm ever going to know. So this is one kind of distribution. The hope is that from here, it goes to the New York Times, Washington Post, Wired. But in order to get it in front of their eyes, you need to be somewhere in this area. It doesn't, this will never get you there. Or you know, very, very rarely, very few journalists, and unless you have some kind of personal connection, is the original document going to be the one that they're reading and you know, writing their story off of. So that's sort of an encouragement for you to talk to someone like me. So as I said, what's next? Uh, I'm going to be starting at the National Science Foundation as a rotator in the fall. Usually these rotator positions are for program directors or higher up people, but they happen to have one in the Office of Legislative and Public Affairs. And so this means that for one to three years I'm going to be in Washington uh, writing more broadly about science, uh, mostly with the Directorate of Computer and Information Science. And that was, that was really cool. I, I was really excited to see this job opening. Um, it was a limited submission only to people who were sort of doing my job at the various universities or governmental institutions across the country. And uh, they actually knew who I was and had read my, thing, my stories before and had a good feeling about me and they hired me for this position. So that's where I'm going to be going, um, which is really nice. I've been a, it's, 
it's been a little bit limiting to only write about supercomputers for six or seven years. As you can imagine, as broad as that field is going to be, um, you know, it's, there's, there's sentences in there that have been repeated many, many times. So I'm excited to talk about you know, neuroscience, and space exploration, and all kinds of other things. So cyborg journalism, you know, that's a bit of a, maybe an overstatement. This is not cyborg journalism. I'm a human, um, as are the scientists who use the system. But I do think that there's something unique about my position. Um, and that's the fact that I and the researchers that I report to are partners on a deep level with machines and ones that can do, you know, unfathomable superhuman activities. So that's probably true for most of you, but I've had that uh, as sort of the, the, the main factor in my job for the last six years. And it's forced me to really think about how we use these machines, what they do for us, what they don't do, where we are in this trajectory, because this is a you know, 50 years, 60 years we've been using supercomputers that are getting you know, millions and millions of times faster than they were before. And they do have a transformative potential, I believe. And so that's what I'm trying to learn as much as possible about from the people I talk to. So here's a cool quote that kind of gets at the heart of this hybrid uh, activity. It's often attributed to Albert Einstein, but it's pretty clear that he did not say this. Maybe Leo Chern said it. And that's that computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. Humans are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. Together, they're powerful beyond imagination. So these, these computers, you know. <laughs> no, I don't think. It, it is, it's definitely not Einstein, but everybody says that it is. I don't know why. So, um, you know, we're, we're a tool using species. That's sort of what defines us to some degree. And yet still, this computational science seems profoundly weird and new to me because after centuries of doing science in a very specific way through experimentation and theory, there's this sort of new way. In a, in a, I won't say a new way. There's a, an added way, a complementary way of doing science uh, that's going to open up avenues of insight, and it involves offloading some of our intelligence to these thousands of interconnected processors. So there's some kind of cyborg connection there that, that I'm thinking of. So as, as all tools extend our abilities, this tool is like creating these imaginary worlds of our own devising in order to replicate the dynamics of the universe. So in the process, we can find out new things that we couldn't do before. And yet, the work is almost entirely immaterial, virtual. There's nothing that comes out of it that you can put your hands on. Even the question about uh, replicability is, is very much not an issue in, in computational science. There's an understanding that these answers will not be repeated all the time based on the new system that you have or the new algorithm that you develop. And yet, it's still providing some kind of predictive value. So, and it can be useful from a commercial sense. So um, I just want to point out this image here. So this was the cover of Nature just from I think, a couple weeks ago. And these were computational findings by one of the users of our systems. He's a leader in the field, Klaus Schulten. He's the person who invented the, the program called NAMD, which is a molecular dynamics software that almost everybody uses. But he is at the, you know, the top of the field, and he's using it to, for the first time, really model the capsid of the HIV virus as a way of understanding how the dynamics of it and where you can intercept certain processes in order to, to stop it. Likewise, this is a, a cover of science from Omar Gattas, who's a researcher at the University of Texas, who used our supercomputers to model the mantle convection within the Earth. And there's, as you know, there's just a lot of things that we can't get to yet with the physical tools that we have or with our microscopes or our telescopes. And so these are places where supercomputing becomes additionally critical. So even after six years of doing this, I feel, still find this research utterly fascinating, and particularly this aspect of it that's just slightly uh, surreal. So, but the articles I write are not really about supercomputers. They're just you know, a hammer that people use in order to build these beautiful houses of knowledge. And so it's really about the creative design, deployment, and use of these technologies. And yet I, I still want to tell people, hey, supercomputers were used in this science because they don't know that. So um, really the only way that comes out in a journal article is in that little acknowledgment section at the end that says computations were provided by so-and-so. And maybe that's all they deserve. And I'd love to have that conversation about what the real value of these technologies are and the credit that's due. You know, you, Large Hadron Collider 
people know what that is, right? That's the instrument has very much foreground in the science that goes around it. Our systems do not. And I think that's a sociological problem. And I think it's also just that there haven't been a lot of people doing what I'm doing. Do you mean the specific system, or do you just mean the fact that... Either. Yeah, no, that there, that there are supercomputers and that scientists use them to a pretty large degree. Not even supercomputers. Let's just say computers. You know, they just don't know that that's a part of it. So um, there's a phrase we use in our, in our field a lot, and it's called the third pillar of science. It's big. Has anybody ever heard this? Okay, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> insider baseball. So, uh, yeah, to, I'm just going to read the highlighted part here. Together with theory and experimentation, computational science now constitutes the third pillar of scientific inquiry, enabling research to build and test models of complex phenomena that cannot be rep replicated in the laboratory. And I think the first line is kind of important here, too. This country has not awakened to the central role played by computational science in high-end computing. So this was written in 2005. I think it's fair to say that we have awakened to this to some degree. It's definitely a lot more in the air than it was when I started. So, quick quiz. Who's ever heard of a supercomputer? <laughs> okay, that's good. How many people have ever heard, heard of TAC, the Texas Advanced Computing Center? Okay, handful. How about TerraGrid or Exceed? Okay, that's cool. How many people here use supercomputers or at least uh, parallel processing at some level in their work? Okay, that's a good subset there. And how about other researchers at your university? Do you guys know people who do this? Or is, is there anybody here who doesn't? Who doesn't know anybody who uses supercomputers or know that they're important? Okay, good. That's what I was hoping for. So these are a little bit more in-depth questions, which you can raise your hand or not if you feel like it. Who considers themselves primarily a computer scientist or programmer versus a researcher in a specific domain or field? Is there anybody here who fits into that category? Does anybody think that in a generation there's going to be any distinction? That, that the people who are studying under you? OK, good. Uh, who doesn't use supercomputers because they had a bad experience with them? <laughs> no one? No, oh, that's good. OK. I think there's a lot of people out there who have. They're not, it's not trivial to, to get up to speed on these technologies, to stay there as they continue to evolve. And it takes a lot of time just to write these. Uh, super. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got a computer on your lap. <laughs> uh, who would use supercomputers if, they were more, if they're easier to use? Okay, that's cool. And what would you do? What if you could just do a simulation, trust the results, share them, try something out without a huge amount of effort? Would that make a difference in your interest and willingness in using supercomputers? Okay. <laughs> Good question. Yes, please. Anybody can ask any questions at any time. Just jump in. Yeah. Something that is in your computational center, in your computer center, or you can sort of define grid as a supercomputer as well. Do I define what? The grid. The grid. Oh, the grid, yeah. Uh, grid computing is perfectly fine. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, so it's, so it's the cloud, yes. How many times faster than your typical workstation or laptop do you need to be to be a supercomputer? <laughs> Um, I, I'm not really going to make that distinction. I mean, I, I think cluster computing would be another way of talking about this high performance. Okay. Advanced computing, it's not really important. It's, it's more that the, the question is more that there are things that can't be done on your desktop and that they need special technologies and special knowledge in order to scale up beyond that point. Okay. So I wouldn't make any distinction. That's why grids are important because, in a sense, if you have a supercomputer in your lab, that's yeah. nice. You can do stuff. With yeah. Now, right? um, with my desktop, I can submit my job to the grid. Yeah. So I have my own oh. supercomputer and everything. Sure. Yes. I, I probably did the order of this a little bit off. Because our supercomputers are available for free to anyone at any university or research center in the United States. Yes, there is an allocation process. Uh, it's it's not particularly rigorous, but it does take some some knowledge and understanding. Uh, I've been in, I've been in on the you know the discussions. I think all of you guys are eligible. Um, but you're right. The grid is great. Cloud is great. All all those terms can just be put in place of supercomputing in stock. So this is the most important slide from my perspective. Um, I want to know what you think. You know, that's what I'm here for, is to discuss some of these issues with you, to learn how you use them, what they're not doing for you, what they could be doing for you, or, or why they're not even that interesting. I'd like to know this so that I have a better foundation for everything I write. So for those of you who are using high-performance computing, the grid, cloud, any of that, 
I'd love to know how you use these and how you access these, these resources. And for those of you who are not, I'm just curious to know why. I mean, I know there are a lot of things that don't need more than a desktop, but I don't think that the Large Hadron Collider researchers and the black hole researchers, I, think, I don't think that's the case with you guys, so I'd like to know why. And so just feel free to pull me aside or come into my office and rant. Just tell me everything you think about this, this field so that I can have a better foundation for my core audience, which are scientists. You know, I, I try to get the information to the public as much as possible, but I, I do acknowledge that the people I'm most interested in reaching are probably the scientists and the funders, because that's the reality of what my job is. Okay. So you guys said that you've heard of Exceed and TerraGrid. I'm going to go through this real quick. Exceed is this thing, the Extreme Science and Engineering Discovery Environment. It's a terrible name. But it's just a collection of centers, resources, and people that enable science across the country. And uh, there are, I'll show you on the next page. So with TerraGrid, which was the, the previous project, um, more than 10,000 scientists used it to complete you know, thousands of research projects at no cost, no you know, actual cost. These are the organizations that are, that are part of Exceed at this point. It's a long list, so it's a big virtual organization. Most of these don't have the resources, but they do offer you know, some services and help and are part of this larger network. That's us down there. Uh, it's led by the University of Illinois National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which is sort of one of the more established and older centers. PAC, this is our little PAG line, Powering Discoveries That Change the World. Our mission is to enable discoveries that advance science and society through the application of advanced computing technologies. And I don't know if, if your organizations have mission statements, but it is kind of nice to work for an organization that has a mission. It kind of gives you an, uh, an orientation for your day. And so here's an example of how we make a difference in the world. The Gulf oil spill, the BP, um, Deepwater Horizon explosion caused a lot of oil to flow into the Gulf, which is very close to where we are. And uh, we work with a lot of top scientists who do um, modeling of water dynamics. And so we integrated in a real-time way their science with the data that we were taking in about where the oil was from, from satellite uh, imagery. And we were able to predict where the oil was going to move. And consequently, the Coast Guard and other people were able to get in front of the oil spill because of this. So there are emergency real-time applications that supercomputers can and are applied to, weather, of course, being the most obvious, hurricane modeling. But increasingly, this is going to be where we're going. So more about TAC real quick. I'm very proud of this place where, where I've worked. I'm going to work for the National Science Foundation, but I'm still going to be uh, part of the Texas Advanced Computing Center and spending some of my time there and returning there afterwards. So I'm still kind of invested. We're a pretty new organization, 12 years old. Our claim to fame, supposedly, is that we developed the first Linux clusters for the scientific community are based on commodity components. And basically what this did was you know, make the cost of building a cluster significantly cheaper. And it's defined the last 10, 10 years and probably the next 10 years of how these things are built and designed. Um, we're kind of an upstart in the field or in the area. We've, we've won a string of these NSF solicitations for big systems against much bigger, stronger uh, competition. And we have a startup mentality. So we just are growing constantly. We're you know, very agile and change our strategies as needed. And we don't just do simulation and modeling. We really aspire to leadership in visualization, data analysis, and storage technologies as well. You know, advanced computing has gotten a lot broader than the simulation modeling you maybe think of before and has a lot of other components. They've been sort of disparate, and now we're bringing it all together so that you can have a workflow that goes from the model the visualization to the data analysis to the sharing to the, the you know, whatever else you want to do with it. So it's a, PAC is a pretty interesting place to work for. I see it somewhere in between a brain trust and a public utility plant <laughs> because it's kind of, it kind of looks and feels that way. And you walk past these giant supercomputers and all the infrastructure that they require to run every single day and you just kind of feel a little bit like you're working at the, the waterworks. But... In this case, and I think it's an apt metaphor because computing is becoming this resource that we all take for granted and that is um, you know, valuable at scale and it needs to get to you somehow. And so we're the people that are able to do that 
primary, and so it's about a third PhD domain scientists. We work directly with researchers. If you have a problem or if your code isn't as fast as you want it to be, you come to us. We understand where you're coming from. We're able to pair you with somebody and make it go better, go faster. About a third hackers and IT whizzes and a third regular folks like me. And uh, I'd say primarily we design, build, and keep these advanced computing systems running so that you guys don't have to. You know, having the cluster that someone's got to manage in your department or in your office is just not a sustainable solution as things get bigger and more powerful or as you want more, more resources. So something like these national centers have to exist to give it to you. But it's, it's not a perfect solution by any means. Ranger, rest in peace. It was the fifth most powerful system in the world when it came online in 2008. When it went offline in 2013, it was still the 50th most powerful supercomputer in the world. So they, they, you know, other systems catch up, but it's not that fast. But after four years or five years in this case, the power used to run it is no longer worth running it. It's better just to give it away to someone else. So we, we shipped it to Africa and to Texas A&M. And, uh, <laughs> and they're going to use it. And it's going to be great. But for us, we want to have the, the newest technology. And we cleared all that stuff out of our machine room. And now we have room for the newest system. But over that time, 359 institutions used it, 2,200 research projects, 4,000 scientists, 2.1 billion processor core hours. So it did a lot of science. It was really the workhorse for the scientific community for the last four or five years. When I say scientific community, I mean those people who use supercomputers or the grid or the cloud. So it, it did its work. It wasn't for the largest scale users. There were other systems where maybe only three or four groups would have the entire supercomputer, and they did much larger work. This was more the middle of the road, you know, the, the center of the bulge kind of scientists. And a lot of work got done, a lot of publications. Now it's gone. We have our newest system. It's called Stampede. We always give them these clever Texas-themed names, or not that clever, just Texas-themed names. And uh, its peak performance is 10 petaflops. It's another about $50 million investment. Fills this giant machine room. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, it will. It's uh, the the workhorse now for the open scientific community. And it's free to use, and it came online in January and already has 6,000 researchers using it. So very quick adap adoption. Um, has anybody heard of this system? One, two, three, yes. And the, the, the interesting thing, at least in the technological community about this, is that it's the first large-scale installation of the Intel Xeon Phi coprocessor, which is they put 60 or so processors on a single chip for certain applications is able to just really do amazing amounts of science really fast. Um, but that's for people who know how to use it, which is nobody at this point. So it's sort of this add-on component to the system that over the five years that, this, that Stampede is around, people will eventually ramp up on. But that's not happening just yet. But we're still very proud. Oh, I don't know if anybody heard about the Chinese system that was just the, the largest in the world. So that relied almost entirely on these new processors that I just described, the Xeon Phi. And that's how they were able to be so fast and powerful. So I'll skip over these. These are just a couple of the early research projects that I thought were pretty interesting on Stampede. So there's some CO2 capture and conversion by some researchers at MIT. And these are nano catalysts that you just can't see where the atoms are moving on the surfaces with any current technology. And so supercomputers are really good at doing that and tuning them, tuning, tuning the fabrication and design of them so that they can do interesting things. In this case, to take CO2 from uh, an exhaust stream and convert it into cyclic carbonate, which is a valuable substance, substance for industrial applications. So if that could happen, that would be really, really big. You know, I think it's in the early stages, but it's the kind of work that we're excited about people doing. Another one is improving brain tumor imaging. This is one of those real-time applications where if in the course of a few hours or 24 hours, you're really able to improve the accuracy of brain scans, it gives the surgeons a lot more information about how to do the surgery. And so what that takes in this case is combining a number of modalities of imaging with biophysical tumor models that predict how things generally grow. And, that, and that's been shown to uh, really improve the, the quality of the imagery. Um, but it involves these complex computations that 
no hospital is able to do at this point, but eventually they will. So I, I see a lot of these things as the early stage of, um, of science that will be normal in 10 to 20 years. So we're in this era of big science, right? And so I, I feel like what I do kind of fits into this. It's large-scale research that has to be funded by national governments, complex funding infrastructures, large interdisciplinary groups, these giant instruments. And so HPC is a part of this trend, but I think it also differs in the sense that it's very much a general purpose instrument. So it doesn't do one thing for one community. It does whatever you can teach it to do for many communities. Um, and at least in the most recent sort of dialogue around Exceed and our center and this whole universe, we're really trying to play a democratizing role. We're trying to get more and more diverse people onto the system just to expand the, you know, the value of this to the broader community. So these are our new goals, but I'll just point out the first one. Deepen and extend the impact of e-science infrastructure on research and education, in particular to reach communities that have not pre previously made use of it. So in the last few years, this has been computational biology. Biologists were pretty slow adopters of high-performance computing or, or cloud or grid computing, and now they're huge users of it and doing amazingly interesting stuff. So likewise, we see that there are a number of communities where we can make a real difference and we're reaching out to them. And then beyond computing, you know, we do a lot of teaching, we do a lot of outreach, and then we also communicate our activities to the general public. And that's where I and those like me come in, and that's what the rest of my talk is going to be about. So I'm at 35 minutes. I'm just going to rush through the last parts because it's pretty straightforward stuff, and then I'd love to hear what you guys' thoughts are either in this context or afterwards. So, media outreach. Who here engages actively in media outreach around their work? Okay. Subset. Who does it uh, with great excitement and who does it reluctantly? <laughs> <laughs> and it depends on what it is and when they're asking you to do it. Of course, there's, there's a million, there's a million uh, parts to it. But uh, what, why do it, what to expect, and where to get help? That's what I'm going to get into real quickly. Why should you do it? Well, because you owe it to the taxpayers. You know, they, the taxpayers pay their taxes, and some of that money gets distributed to you to support what you really want to do, which is, I hope it's what you really want to do, which is study the systems that you're studying. And consequently, we have a little responsibility to give back. Um, explicitly, we have a responsibility to give back because it's part of the criteria for getting the grant and for getting the next grant. So it's number four, disseminate the results broadly. Uh, you know, the media can help you with that. It's not something that NSF or anybody else is expecting you to do on your own. That's not what your expertise is in. Your expertise is in something completely different. Why else do it? Well, the journals will ask you to do it. You know, they have their readership, but that's somewhat narrow, and, you know, it can, it can reach a lot larger population if you get it out there. So, Eureka Alert, press releases. Um, Here's an important one. Why do it? Because the media needs you to. Because society needs you to. So once 70 major American newspapers had science sections, now almost none of them do. Science is always the first thing that gets cut when times get rough, says Ira Flatow, NPR. And I think you all know that that's true. I think this, in the last month, the New York Times cut their environmental report, or environmental desk. So it's, it's pretty extreme, the degree to which science is just being cut completely out of the equation. Professional science writers are being cut out of the equation. Not science, because I think the hunger for science stories is greater than ever. Before you leave that, yeah. why are, if, if there is this hunger for yeah. science news, and they all want to sell journals and magazines, why are they cutting science desks rather than something else? I think, well, I, I think it takes more time. Um, I think there's takes more expertise. And I think they're finding other ways to get that information that they don't have to pay for. So that's, that's just my, my perspective on it. Um, I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, sports. More, right? <laughs> it's true. More people would read about Britney Spears' favorite pet than, you know, latest discovery with you super Yeah, but I think it's less extreme than you think. Or, and I have a biased perspective. You know, I'm, I'm looking and reading into this all the time, and so I s maybe see more optimism in uh, the, the public's reaction to science than you guys do. But it's true. But what you're saying is completely true. Um, yes? I just think, I mean, looking at what used to be interesting things like on cable TV, Discovery Channel, National Geographic, it's now been dumbed down to the third or fourth grade level, mm -hmm. if yeah. that. Mm -hmm. 
And I think this is part of the same process. That basically the art, the articles have to assume, you know, yeah. middle school education, yep. and that's no longer uh, perceived to be uh, what most people are willing to spend the effort to do. <laughs> yeah, and it's probably a short changing of the audience too. I really don't think that that's what's needed to reach them. I, I think you can, they can stretch a little bit more. And I, and I don't write at a third grade level, and no one's ever encouraged me to, but uh, often the stories that I write do get picked up by other reporters who don't talk to the researchers, don't read the papers, and then they just sort of skew it any way they want, and, and that's often the case where it gets really dumbed down. Um, so we've talked about why to do outreach. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious. How do you do it? Um, how do you explain your research at a party? There's lots of ways, you know? And you guys all have experience in your everyday life with doing this, whether it's to your children or your parents or whoever. Um, let's see. So what the, what the media are looking for in a story, you know, you, from, the, from the conversation that we've had, I think this is this, the feeling in the room, you know, that they're only interested in chocolate, robots, science fiction gadgets, and experiments that may blow up the world. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that that's not true, that, that, that the public is hungry for, for a broader swath of the science than you think, and that what you do may be more newsworthy than you're imagining. I think it is. So what is news and what's not? Basically, any time you guys publish an article, I, I think it'd be worth an effort to try and talk to some people to see if that article can get out into the world. Um, you know, there's all different journals and some in your research trajectories are some that you think are very important and some that are less. So I'm not telling you every single time go for it. But don't be afraid to because you think it's something that people aren't interested in. Because um, someone like me will find, will find an interest in it or talk you through it and then we'll find a niche and an audience who will be interested in this. Sometimes the secret is timing. So not every story is going to be uh, equally interesting to everyone at all the time. I'm sorry these pictures came out so terrible. This is an article that says, pine pollen still potent miles from the tree. So when do you think this article came out to make a real splash? Allergy season. You know, so everybody's thinking about allergies. You happen to be writing an article about how pollen moves miles from the trees. Well, that's probably the time to get that story out there. So what is also sometimes, but not always, news? A talk at a conference or a meeting, particularly if it's backed up by other papers in the past, as the, the um, space impact story I was talking about was, or if you really think that there's some new discovery that you're, that you're announcing then. What usually isn't news is review papers or white papers, policy papers. You know, it, it could be very interesting to you, but the mainstream media is just not ever going to pick up on it. And so that might be a case we're to be really, really careful about investing a lot of time and trying to get them out there. Also, usually not news, although really important to us in the places where we work, are grants, awards, and fellowships, or new programs, or building dedications. Seems like news, but it just isn't. <laughs> isn't the university always publish those? That you they do. The they do, and they often go nowhere. So I'm not saying you shouldn't try, but I'm just being realistic and telling you that that is not what the, you know, what the, what John Markoff is looking for when he's trying to find his next story. Of the gossip pages in the university, so you know. Yeah. Um, it's our PR department, but you know, the only thing that you hear, you know, it's like this guy got the grant to do this. <laughs> Nothing about the outcomes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I'm guilty of that, too. And for our center, whenever we get a big grant, I think it's the, the biggest news in the world. But, you know, I've learned over time that it isn't. So, you know, the most important thing about trying to explain your work, everything you do is really interesting, but it's far too complex and long-winded for what um, most journalists are going to be looking for. Not all. And some really want to dig into the details and maybe find things that you don't even know are interesting in it. But often, the, the problem is the length and... Uh, the, the complexity and the detail. So dissertations are long and boring. By contrast, haikus are short and simple. So try to craft your, your concept, your, your abstract lead, into, a, into a, a haiku and see how that works. More practically, maybe just turn it into three sentences that would make an elevator pitch. You, know, you have to be able to fluently pitch your idea in, in clear words to the public 
in order to, to even get them interested in the first place. So that's the first step. So this came up before. I, I think it's kind of an interesting just statistic, but why is it important to be brief? Well, here's why, because all the things, all the ways that people get their news are brief. TV story, 80 seconds, if that. Radio story, 45. Newspaper article, 400, 600 words. That's not very much, you know, to get these points across. And then obviously the undergraduate attention span. I'll get that last one. <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> I don't know, I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> it's probably not accurate, but it's, uh, it's uh, illustrative. So, <laughs> so say it simply. I like this one. You know, this is the simplified version for the general public. He says as he points to the equation. I feel that's accurate for here. You guys are all working on very complex equations. You know, only your peers are going to understand those. You have to be able to put it into words. So that's a pretty obvious point. Don't slide into incomprehensible jargon. Analogies are your friend, your best friend, possibly. Just think what in someone's everyday life that you could compare this to and use that. And then this last one's pretty important, too. It's okay to repeat yourself. The likelihood is that the person that you're speaking to is not going to get everything the first time. Uh, you've been studying this field for decades, and they have just heard about it for the first time. So you're in very different places, and it's okay to repeat yourself. And it's definitely okay for you to say, if you have any questions about this, I'd love to answer them for you, or look at a draft of your article to correct any, you know, any errors. And they'll pre by and large, they'll appreciate that as long as you're willing to do it in a timely way. Because um, they want to get it right. I want to get it right. So the big picture. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Questions that you might be asked. Big picture. Why should we care about this? It's something you just got to tell people. And even if it's basic research, if it's, if it's not something that has daily applicability, there still should be an answer to that question. Can you think of any good analogies? Do you have any images? And then what's next? I always like to ask, what's next? Where's this going? What do you, what, I also like to ask, what excites you about this research? I want to get the personal perspective in and disarm who I'm talking to a little bit. So some tips. If you have a paper in review, think it's likely to be accepted, contact your press officer or your public information officer. Who here does that? Anyone? Like actually just reach out. Say, hey, I have a paper I'm really excited about. I, I think you should write something about it for the university or for my center. Occasionally. Occasionally. Okay. Well, when do you do it? It's an exciting result. Okay. Are there times where you think it's an exciting result, but you don't do it because you think that they're not going to be excited? No. Well, good. Then you're doing the right things. Just keep pushing those there because you're there to train them to some degree. You know, and I, and I think most people, most people who, <laughs> well, I hope not write the article, uh, you're, you're there to at least tell them why it matters. Um, so here's things you may not know about your press officer and why you should care. They write for a living. You know, they're not really that bad at this. Their job is to tell the media about your work. They have media contacts and dissemination tools that you just don't have and may have never thought about before. And then this is the stage where you have the most control. I think that last one's pretty important. I think a lot of people don't embrace the media. A lot of scientists don't embrace the media because they're afraid that the wrong messages are going to be taken away from it, that they're not going to have control over what is said in this. And this is one place where you have control, and it's often... The, the, the article that Wired is going to write down the road is just going to steal blatantly from this press release. So if you can get it right here, you're assured of getting most of it right in the, the larger, uh, larger publication. So timing is everything. You know, definitely alert your, your press officer when the paper is in the pipeline. This, I never get this. No one ever does this to me. But I would love it if I knew that you know, a big paper is coming out in a couple weeks and here, write it up, and then you'll be able to get it out at the right time. And that's, that's really key to getting a lot of traction. That acceptance works best. So recap, why do it? Because taxpayers want you to, because journals ask you to, and because the media needs you to. Say it simply, don't use jargon, use analogies, and contact your press officer. And when, before publication is best. So, all right, thanks everybody for listening. Um, if there's time, which I think there might be, we're at 48 minutes. No, we're over, right? Okay. Um, if, if, if anybody wants to talk either about the role of supercomputing, about the media, and any interactions you've had, or how you can reach a broader audience, or whether you even want to, 
whether you want to reach somebody who has, you know, who's, who's going to read that dumbed down ultimate version. I think that's an open question. It's not a necessary thing that you guys do this, but I encourage you to, and, and I enjoy reading the results of your research down the road, not necessarily in the publications that you write them for, but in some mediated form. So for someone like me, of which there are many, I think it's a value. Okay, any, thanks. More questions? Yes. So related to the first part of your talk, um, in front of me, I'm an astronomer. Yeah. Uh, in front of me, there's uh, coming up in the next few years, decade or so, there's going to be a really big computing problem related to something called the Large uh, Synaptic Survey Telescope, LSST. Uh -huh. It's going to gather an enormous amount of data that it's presently not entirely understood how exactly that's going to be analyzed. Okay. And exactly uh, what the computing requirements are uh, for how that even gets disseminated to scientists. Yeah. And how to use, how to actually access the data. Okay. Uh, it's a huge data science problem that will be coming up in astronomy in the near future. <coughs> Yes, I think it's one of many large data problems that are coming up in astronomy and in other fields as well. The data is definitely the buzzword in our field. We're moving very much from a simulation and modeling based framework to something that's, that also encompasses the data analysis and visualization workflows. And so that's where almost all of the new systems are going to, in that space is where all of the new supercomputers are going to be coming and where a lot of the hiring and promotion is going to be. So I think that's a really interesting question. I'd love to know what we're going to do. We weren't. The, the Exceed, our center, were not really involved in any of the analysis of the LHC data. That was done in a, in a different way across continents. And Internet 2 took the lead, I believe, in that. But I think there's probably a similar model. Is there a question over here? Yes. So there, there are many scientists who now have their blogs. Yeah. I kind of wanted to get to that, but I didn't. Do you see them as a competition, as a source of information? As, uh, as what? Uh, definitely as a source of information and partners. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's great for, for people, for scientists to blog independently. I think it's the most direct way for you guys to get your messages across, but it takes a lot of time. I mean, I think there's three ways to deal with the media. You can ignore it, you can really embrace it, or you can use it strategically. And I see people who are blogging as someone who are really embracing it. Uh, there's a guy who I'm friendly with named Joe Hansen, and he... Um, just finished his biology PhD at the University of Texas, and he's got this great Tumblr blog. Time Magazine called it one of the top 50 Tumblrs in the world. And he, he's super knowledgeable, both on his subject and on a, a wide variety of things, and he just puts it out there directly. He's now working for Wired Magazine as the AAAS fellow, the, the science writing fellow for them. So he's sort of maybe moving away from the self-blogging and into a more you know, publication-based system. But I, I, I think that's really fascinating. There's a lot of people doing it really well, but I don't see it being a general solution for scientists. Yes? Is there any uh, idea of using supercomputing in an interactive mode? One gets the impression yes. now that it's more, quote-unquote, batch jobs rather than to and throwing. Yes, there's, there's definitely ways of using it interactively and also an interest w within the field of doing more interactive um, work. We have one system, a visualization system, that's fully interactive. So you, you, know, it, it, you send it your problem, um, and it ships you back pixels so that you can move and, do, and change the simulation of the visualization on the fly in real time. And then there's also ways of not going through the batch system, just sort of going you know, back door, using s fewer numbers of nodes we, we allow that perfectly fine so that if you have, it's often in the beginning stages, right? You're not sure if an algorithm is going to work or you need to test a certain loop. That's really hard right now in supercomputers. You have to wait, you know, a day to get your problem running and it runs and then nothing happened and then you have to wait another day. So that's a very valid question and something, yeah, I think that's being worked on. Would you use it more if it was interactive? Oh, I mean, a lot of the problems I do are sort of in, a, in interactive model fitting. Okay. And you know, if you go on the wrong path, you can spend a lot of yeah. time doing the wrong thing, and you want to get results back reasonably fast so you know that you're doing the, right, the wrong or the right thing. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great case study part. Oh. Thank you guys so much for coming. I appreciate it.